domanda sul condividere la cena del Signore non è facile per me risponderla, soprattutto davanti a un teologo come il Cardinal Casper. <ride> <ride> Ho paura! <ride> Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Matt for The Rundin Forum with yet another edition of As the Post-Catholic Vatican Turns. The situation in Rome is so out of control now that serious Catholics around the world are regularly discussing exactly how, when, and why to depose a Pope. In other words, that discussion is getting started all around. Now, the latest bizarro land stunt out of the Vatican is an announcement that Pope Francis will travel to Sweden in October for a joint ecumenical commemoration of the Protestant Revolt. Yes, you heard that right. The Protestant Revolt. That revolt. The one where the Catholic priest named Martin Luther, Father Martin Luther, decided that the Christian Church had been wrong for 1,500 years, that Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, and every doctor and father of the Church back to St. Peter had it all wrong when it came to the papacy and the Pope, and that it was also time to tear up the Bible to fit Father Martin Luther's sola scriptura theories, and it was time to deny the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and oh, by the way, it was time for Father Luther to find himself a nice sweet little thing to settle down with, and so he married Sister Katie Van Bora. An interesting time. Now, Martin Luther said of the, of the papacy, the true Antichrist is sitting in the temple of God and is reigning in Rome, that empurpled Babylon. Now, this comes from a guy who, by his own admission, was inspired with a certain knowledge while on his toilet seat, no less, that the church was the great whore of Babylon, that four of her seven sacraments were abominations, as were her priesthood, celibacy, papacy, and monastic life. On his toilet, Martin Luther figured it all out, that all we needed is faith alone in order to be saved. Works don't matter. The situation at the time was so evil, so heretical, so immoral, so demonic, that the great St. Thomas More considered the marriage of Martin Luther to Sister Katharina Van Bora to be a diabolical union that gave birth to the Antichrist, the Protestant religion. St. Thomas More used the Greek word anarchos to describe it. He believed that the whole great change of European consciousness in the 16th century was due to the hatred that Protestants bore at the time to all good order and to the great hunger that they had for disorderedness. St. Thomas More regarded Lutherans as what he called daemonum satellites, agents of demons who had to be stopped before they brought civilized society to ruin. And yet this same Lutheran revolt that wrecked Christendom, that prompted Pope St. Pius V to call the Council of Trent to try to do something about the chaos and the schism going on in Christendom, now is going to be celebrated by our Holy Father, Pope Francis. He's even taken it upon his humble self to apologize to the Lutherans for the terrible treatment they received 500 years ago from those fundamentalist Catholics who, living in the dark ages of faith, had not yet walked into the light of ecumenical babble and diabolical dialogue. On October 31st, Pope Francis will travel to the Swedish city of Lund, where, according to Vatican Radio, a one-day event will include a common worship service condemned, of course, by Pope Pius XI, a common worship service in Lund Cathedral based on a Catholic Lutheran common prayer ceremony led by Pope Francis and Lutheran World Federation President Bishop Janun. Blah, blah, blah. What is it going to take, neo-Catholics? What is it going to take? Are you guys really okay with this? Jimmy Aiken, George Weigel, you guys all right with this? No problem at all with this? If this had been predicted a year ago that the Pope would do this, would you say, terrific, I can't wait, or would you say, no, impossible, it will never happen? Well, now it's happening. And this is nothing more than a rehabilitation of Protestant heretes, heresies and heretics, including Martin Luther, who famously said of the papacy, quote, if I am prompted to say thy kingdom come, I must perforce add, cursed, damned, destroyed, must be the papacy, end quote. And of the venerable Roman rite of the Catholic Church, it was Father Martin Luther 
who said, quote, I declare that all the brothels, all the manslaughters, murders, thefts, and adulteries have wrought less abomination than the Popish Mass, end quote. Chris Ferrara, is this Pope of ours attempting, as St. Saint Robert Bellarmine warned, is he attempting to destroy the Catholic Church, or what are we seeing here? Well, the way I would put it, is he's, he's attempting to complete the process of auto-demolition that Paul VI remarked very shortly after the Second Vatican Council. I mean, what's next? Are we going to have a celebration of the rebellion of Lucifer? Because, after all, Lucifer was merely attempting to assert a legitimate autonomy. He's very much misunderstood. It's time for dialogue with the souls in hell, as the Onion pointed out in a satirical piece on the post conciliar Catholic Church. That's how ridiculous it is. The, the Onion is satirizing this nonsense. But what is ecumenism? Think of ecumenism as a railroad track. And there's a train on the railroad track, which is the Catholic Church. Headed south, headed down. The track only goes in one direction. The Protestants left the station up north 500 years ago. And they're barreling down the track toward the end of the line. And the Catholic Church is panting in its effort to catch up with them. And so we have this process of the, of the one-way one -way street, the one-way track. We keep chasing after the Protestants of various denominations, insisting that we are enjoying a growing unity with them, when actually the distance between us is either further and further apart, if you look at it objectively, or closer and closer at these gatherings where we pretend that the differences between us no longer matter, and we can just declare that we are in a state of communion, even though objectively we're not. It's a form of collective delusion on the part of churchmen. Well, I like I like the fact that you said we can you know make these declarations or pretend otherwise. I mean, let's talk about that for a minute because I've noticed with a lot of our our friends, the neo Catholic friends especially, they're saying, well, you know, this is Christ like. Francis is being Christ like. He's just going into there. He's meeting people where they are, the Protestants, and he's trying to show them the face of Christ. Now we know he's meeting them where they are, and then he's leaving them there and not trying to correct them. But Chris, I want you to say something about this game of let's pretend. In other words, you can say that Francis is doing what Christ wants him to do. That's fine. This is the, the new orientation of the church calls for Peter to do this. But then we have to have a discussion about the obvious contradiction. I'm talking an absolute contradiction between what Francis is doing right now and what St. Pope, Pope Pius XI, for example, said in Mortalium Animos, which was a re reiteration of the previous infallible teachings of the church, condemning pan-religious prayer ceremonies and so forth in the name of peace or whatever. So, so the, what I want you to comment on, or I'm asking you about, what do we say to these people? I mean, in other words, if you think it's okay what's happening, great. But now we have to have a discussion, which pope are we going to believe? What do we do with the contradiction between the two popes? And what would you say to that? There's nothing Christ-like about hobnobbing with people who, by any objective standard of Christianity, are lunatics. Even Martin Luther would be demanding that these maniacs be burned at the stake. They're ordaining women as priests and bishops. They've legitimated homosexual conduct. They're even ordaining and consecrating as bishops practicing homosexuals who purport to be married to other fellow sodomites. Of course, they accept abortion, divorce, contraception, and sodomy as a legitimate human activity. These people have gone so far beyond Christianity uh, that they've progressed even to the point where you can't even call them neo-pagans. They're just insane, especially the Lutheran World Federation. The Lutheran World Federation is an agglomeration of lunatical sects. The more serious Lutherans, say the Missouri Synod Lutherans or the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans, for example, are not members of the Lutheran World Federation because they want nothing to do with these screwballs. And yet these are the Vatican's dialogue partners. It's an absolute collective form of insanity. At this so point, are we seeing it's going there to celebrate a liturgy with these people. And who are these people, Mike? They're yeah. laymen dressed up in bishop's costumes. And this is trick-or-treat because... It's happening on Halloween. Right, in, right. In so what, what we're seeing here, Chris, They're is... They're playing trick-or-treat. At least arguably, this is not a celebration of, of ecumenical accomplishment or success, right? This is a celebration of modernism, just on steroids, in the Catholic Church, and, as you just pointed out, in the Lutheran Federation as well. This is the most extreme modernist sort of sect of Lutheranism, and that's what they seem to be, seem to be celebrating. Both of these religions, both of these Christian you know, traditions, moving beyond doctrine and dogma and just setting up sort of some sort of John Lennon-esque 
you know, brotherhood of man, civilization of love that has nothing to do with doctrine and dogma or Christ, right? Isn't that what's going on here? Well, ecumenism is obviously a failure if the end of ecumenism is to achieve the reunification of Christians in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That's an absolute failure. So the new approach is simply to declare success in the face of failure and to say that there's a growing communion between us and these crazy sects when in fact they're further away from Rome than they ever have been in the past five, 500 years and the process of acceleration is proceeding geometrically. Well, in the past 50 years they've, they've deteriorated in ways no one could have imagined. Ordaining women as bishops. Are, they, are you kidding me? These, these cults don't even deserve the respectability of being called ecclesial bodies. They're gaggles of loons. And the Pope is going over to Sweden, the, the nerve center of, of moral decrepitude in the Western world, to celebrate a liturgy with these people who pretend to be clerics. And what are they going to do in terms of this liturgy? They're going to use this common prayer that was devised for the occasion with the approval of the Vatican. Let me quote a couple of key passages from this common prayer. For over 50 years, Lutherans and Catholics have been on a journey from conflict to communion. No, they haven't. They've been on a journey into la-la land. There's no communion between us and these people the Pope is going to celebrate a joint liturgy with. They, they reject fundamental doctrines and dogmas of the faith. They don't even retain the moral law. Again, what they're doing is simply declaring a communion that doesn't exist. So again, it's a form of collective self-delusion. Here's another passage. With joy we have come to recognize that what's, what unites us is far greater than what divides us. On this journey, mutual understanding and trust have grown. Again, this is purely delusional. These people don't even have a semblance of authentic Christianity. And Martin Luther himself, as I said a few moments ago, would look upon these sects with horror. In fact, he himself lived long enough to regret the effects of what he had done by introducing the principle of private judgment into what was once a unified Christendom. He could see what happened with the Peasants' War. He could see what happened with the uh, already occurring multiplication of Protestant sects. Today you have a, a Protestant evangelical, R.C. Sproul, admitting that the Catholic Church had a point when it suppressed, even by forcible means, the spread of these errors because it would result in the division of Christendom, the fragmentation of belief, and the loss of something as basic as morality. And yet Sproul says, nevertheless, we have to uphold the precious principle of private judgment. Well, that's what the Vatican is doing by going to Sweden, to celebrate communion with these people when no communion exists. It's so yeah. obvious. You know, what would be funny, or I guess we should still we should start trying to predict what he's going to do next and then query our, our neo-Catholic friends and say, if this happens, then are you gonna are you gonna object? Because it would you know, it would have been fun for say for example a month ago to say we think that within a month's time, the Pope, that maybe some Lutherans will be receiving Holy Communion in the Vatican. And that the Pope, instead of condemning that, will say, hmm, well, maybe, maybe not. we got to talk about this. we got to pray about it, blah, blah, blah. And yet now that's happened. And I really wonder if our neo-Catholic friends are saying, oh, good, it's about time that the Lutherans can receive Holy Communion. That's great. They, they, they know what the, what the law of the church is on that. They know you can't do that. But now that it's happened, what do we hear? Nothing. We hear crickets. I guess it's okay. Well, in order for this venture to succeed, you would have to accept the conclusion that the truth no longer matters. Doctrinal yeah. truth no longer matters. Moral truth no longer matters because the Lutheran World Federation is composed of churches and adherents of various Protestant sects who simply disregard fundamental truths in the doctrinal realm and in the moral realm. Their morality is shot and their doctrine is full of heresy. So in order for this communion to be declared a success, you'd have to deny the validity of Catholic teaching, say that truth no longer matters, that morality no longer matters. All that matters is that they happen to have been baptized. But the church fathers and the magisterium have always said from, be from the beginning that baptism alone does not make one a member of the mystical body of Christ. You can betray your baptismal vows by lapsing into heresy. You can excommunicate yourself by various acts of either heresy or immorality. And, and these people are objectively lacking even the most fundamental communion with the church. You could say they have a certain relationship to the church by virtue of their baptism, but they left it, they left any possibility of communion a long time ago, and the separation grows worse with each passing year of the ecumenical venture. But listen to what they're going to say 
during this joint liturgy, according to this book of common prayer. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us to rejoice in the gifts that have come to the church through the Reformation. We're supposed to thank God at this gathering. The Pope is going there to thank God for the Reformation that destroyed the unity of Christendom, broke apart a unity that had endured for a thousand years, and ultimately destroyed both public and private morality. As any idiot can see today, when you look at the way these, uh, these adherents of the various sects live their lives and the morality that they're promoting. Again, everything from contraception to abortion to divorce and remarriage to the habitual practice of sodomy, they accept it all. And the Pope is going there to thank God for the Reformation that was the beginning of this process of civilizational self-destruction. Unbelievable. Uh, let, me ask, let me ask Jimmy Aiken a question, personally. Mr. Aiken, let me see you try to justify the Pope going to Sweden to thank God for the Reformation. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to keep putting these questions out there, Chris, because think about what they're not, what they're, what they're obviously not unified on, and in fact, the Catholic Church is now dismissing as unimportant. The, you know, the Church is teaching on Mariology. The Church is teaching on the Real Presence. The Church is teaching theology of the papacy, the priesthood. All of that apparently is not... The fact that they don't have an agreement on that is, is in no sense an impediment towards this, this imaginary union. So obviously those dogmas are not very important, Chris. And this brings up a question I've got for you, which really terrifies me. Uh, it seems like since Francis has gotten on board, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of questionable attitudes and statements about the Eucharist, Chris. I mean... We just got through the synod where they want to start passing out communion to divorce and remarriage. That was a blasphemy before, or a sacrilege before. They want to try to work that out to make that happen. I'm sure you've noticed, it's been commented a lot on, that Pope Francis doesn't genuflect at the consecration, Chris. I don't know if that means anything or not. To me, it does. I, I don't quite understand how that, how that can be glossed over when he has no trouble getting down on all fours and slobbering all over the feet of Muslim women on Holy Thursday. Uh, why he can't genuflect at consecration is beyond me. But I, I tell you what's happening, and now this with the Lutherans, I'm beginning to have a sense that belief in the real presence in the Vatican right now is evolving to something new and different and not at all what it was in the past. What do you think? That, that may well be, but of course the entire Novus Ordo liturgy was designed to de-emphasize the belief in the real presence, which the Protestants consider anathema. The idea that there is a, a real and, and true change of substance so that the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ are present under the appearances of bread and wine and that the appearances are, are just that. The substance of bread and wine no longer exists. They regard this as a superstition. So now we're apparently we're going to reach the point where we're going to permit in some circumstances, maybe not, maybe, maybe this will be forestalled at the last moment, intercommunion. I mean, it happened during the recent visit of the Lutheran delegation to the Vatican. Afterwards, the priest in St. Peter's Basilica insisted on administering Holy Communion to the members of this delegation. And, and who objected to this? Apparently, one Catholic bishop in Finland raised an objection and said that was a mistake. The Vatican didn't say it was a mistake. Francis didn't say it was a mistake. This bishop in Finland said it was a mistake. But you know, let me, let me put another question to the neo-Catholic first responders. And Mr. Aiken in particular, give us 10 reasons to know and share about why we should accept the following statement in the common liturgy that is going to be celebrated in October. Thanks be to you, O God, for the many guiding theological and spiritual insights that we have all received through the Reformation. Are you kidding me? The Council of Trent anathematized infallibly the errors of Martin Luther. In the bull Exergia Domine, Leo X condemned Luther's errors, and Leo, and Leo X ultimately excommunicated this heretic. So now we're going to praise God and thank him for the anathematized errors that we received through the Reformation, whose principal founders were a lowlife degenerate who ran off and married a nun, and a syphilitic king who wanted a divorce? Yeah. How are you going to justify this? Neo-Catholic first responders, what are you going to say when this happens? Are you going to remain silent? Or are you going to say, finally, that's enough, this has gone too far? I'm waiting to see. Yeah, me too, Chris. And I'm gonna, we're running a little short on time, but I want to end this, and I want to get your insight on this as well. 
Um, I have I have a, a pretty good friendship, uh, newspaper to newspaper, editor to editor, with the Missouri Synod Lutherans at Christian News. They're like the traditional Lutherans. And I get their newspaper, they get mine. We've had it for 40 years. We have it in exchange. So lest anybody in our neo-Catholic constituency say, oh, you guys are not loving. You're trying to condemn all Protestants to hell. You're calling them all heretics in the same sense that Martin Luther was a heretic. I hasten to interject that what we're trying to do here with our, with, our, with our Protestant friends is give them the fullness of truth, Chris. We have good debates back and forth. We're not trying to condemn Protestants or be nasty or be mean to them. We're trying to do what Catholics have done for thousands of years with those who don't agree with us because Christ instituted this church. It is the sole means of salvation, and we want everybody into this church. So we're not trying to condemn our Lutheran friends or be mean or nasty to them. We're trying to do what the church has always done. Reach out to them with the truth. Not reach out with them and tell them to stay put. Here's what I would tell to the more conservative Protestants, and I consider a number of them to be my friends. I would tell them that the liberal Pope Francis does not represent the authentic teaching of the church. How many times have I had to answer the charge that the Catholic Church has gone liberal? Because obviously, to all appearances, it has gone liberal. Again and again, I have to remind them that when the Pope does things like this, when he goes and performs stunts like the one that's being planned for Sweden, that is not an authentic act of the magisterium. That is a misjudgment on the part of a particular Pope. So I would tell the more conservative Protestants who might be watching this broadcast, not only is the authentic teaching not being presented here, you should be embracing the fullness of the authentic teaching of the Church and join the Catholic Church and add your militant spirit to the militant spirit of the traditionalist movement in the Church which is the last line of defense against this insanity. It isn't that the church is going to be destroyed, but St. Paul spoke of a great apostasy coming for the, in the future. And, and the Bible speaks of, of even the elect being deceived, if that were possible. Right, right, right. Well, let's, let's just drive home the way we conclude this program off, and, and that is... You know, if, if the remnant is, is saying too much, if we're, we're working too hard to expose what's happening, please understand, we're not enjoying this. This is, a ter this is a terrifying moment in the history of our church. But as we see it, and I know you agree with me on this, I'm going to give you the last word to, to, to sum it up. As we see it, we have an obligation before God to stand and object to this. And I realize shining the spotlight on Pope Francis is getting kind of stale. Every time he opens his mouth, something else comes out that's scandalous, it seems. We're not enjoying this. However, many people are beginning, I think, to get battle-weary, and they're either, either going to kind of start checking out altogether, or they're going to start going along with it. I've got a, a friend who goes to a neo-Catholic uh, university, and uh, you know, he, he made the point recently, I said, what about gay marriage? What happens if, if, if the Pope comes out and says gay unions or gay marriages are okay? His answer, and this is a, this is a solid pro-life guy, you know, goes to Mass every Sunday, his answer was... If that happens, then I have to go along with it. If the Pope says gay unions are fine, I have to go along with it. So the remnant is going to continue to fight. We're going to amp it up until this ends. And, and we're following the leadership of cardinals and bishops now who are doing the same thing. Last word to you, isn't that what we're called to do as Catholic journalists? Well, first of all, in a paradoxical way, this, this crisis should only affirm our confidence in the promises of Christ. Because it is prophesied in Scripture that there will come a time when there will be a great falling away from the faith. Our Lord himself said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? I forget the saint who made the prophecy, but he said when our Lord returns, the number of the faithful in the world won't even be enough to fill St. Peter's Square. Now, whether that prophecy is exactly true or not, the gist of it is certainly true. It's predicted in Scripture. The church has vouchsafed for the validity and the infallibility of the Word of God. And this is part of, of the prophecy of Scripture. We have to be ready for these times. It's not a cause for despair. It, it's a cause for buckling on the armor and defending the faith as we were called upon to do when we took our confirmation oath. There's no, there's no reason to give up or walk away. This is the battle that we were made for, if it's happening now, and it appears to be happening now. I'm not going to say another word to take anything away from that. Well said. We will see you next week, Chris. Thanks so much. All we'll right, see Mike. You then. God bless. All right. Good night. That'll do it for us, ladies and gentlemen. Just on a, on a very personal note and very briefly, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank the Remnant family all over the world for just such a warm show of support and promise of prayers uh, during a very difficult time for the Remnant and for my family when my mother... Uh, passed away very suddenly back back in, on January 17th. This was a really difficult time for us. It was very it was very surprising. 
Uh, she still worked for the Remnant. She still drove a car. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman who I owe everything to and love so very much. And losing her was very difficult. But one of the ways that we were able to sort of get, get beyond it and kind of move on a little bit, we haven't accomplished that yet, but one of the ways we were, we were able to begin was through the support, uh, the Christian charity and love and support that was shown to us by so many wonderful Catholics from all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you for that. Um, and I'm also grateful for your patience. Uh, the, the rented office has been in turmoil with funeral and wake and all of that sort of thing. And so we're kind of getting back up, up, up to steam now, and it's been a little slow in book orders and that sort of thing. Thank you for your patience. God bless you all. Please pray for my mother if you think about it. I really would appreciate that. Uh, th thank you so much. Again, I'm Michael Matt for the Remnant Forum, and we'll see you next time.